Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Hello, I'm Judith Stafford and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager in Cereals and Oil Seas for the East Midlands. And I'd like to welcome you to the final session uh, of the day for Agronomy Week. This one, Ecological Principles for Weed Management, stems from the increasing need for a more integrated approach to pest, weed and disease control. The fact that Integrated Pest Management, IPM, is becoming far more in the spotlight. A need to reduce reliance on some of the methods which have served as standard in the past, both cultural and chemical, and a need to reduce inputs whilst at the same time building ever more resilient farm businesses that can withstand both changing economic conditions and increasingly challenging weather patterns. What options then are available for alternative approaches to weed control? And how can we combine sustainable use of herbicides with cultural controls to maximize efficacy? How can we design farming systems that are resistant to outbreaks of problematic weeds, but that are capable of fostering a diverse weed uh, community that supports thriving ecosystems? These are just three of the questions we'll be trying to answer. Which brings me to our speakers, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're speaking. First of all, Emily Pope. Emily is the Senior Knowledge Transfer Manager in AHDB Cereals and um, Oil Seeds. She works closely with both the Knowledge Exchange and the, the research teams. And she plays a key role in the application of research on farms and coordinating the demonstration of research outputs across AHDB's Monitor Farm and Strategic Farm programs. We also have Chloe McLaren uh, joining us from New Zealand. It's from Chloe's previous work that we took the title of this webinar. Chloe's an ecologist at Rothamsted Research, exploring how interactions between plants and their environments can be used to improve agricultural sustainability. She has a particular interest in weeds and how they respond to our efforts to control them. We also have Steve Cook, who's based in the south of England. He delivers agronomy advice on more than 40 farms um, with Hampshire Arable, which has been part of for more than 30 years. And he also works part time for NIAB TAG as a regional agronomist. Apparently referred to by some as the Oracle, Steve's been a past finalist in the Farm Advisor of the Year Awards. And our fourth speaker will be David Miller. Dave is originally from Essex, now also, uh, like Steve, is in Hampshire uh, with the Wheat Sheaf Farming Company. He manages, well, to my mind, is a large area of um, uh, arable, uh, 
Um, it's based on a traditional rotation using companion and cover crops, focusing on long-term soil improvement to build the resilience needed to deal with greater economic and environmental volatility. Amongst his achievements, David was awarded a Nuffield Farming Scholarship in 2014, and he was Arable Farmer of the Year in 2015. Chloe will be talking about her research in this area shortly, and then Steve and David will talk about the practical implications, what it means on the farm. But to start things off, Emily will use insights from AHDB-funded research projects and strategic farm trials to look at managing resistance in weed management. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, and, and just to echo Judith's comments there, thank you, know, thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening for the final session on day one of Agronomy Week. Um, as Judith has said, um, I'm the Senior Knowledge Transfer Manager within Cereals and All Seeds HDB. I joined HDB back in 2015 um, and previous to joining the organisation, I did my PhD at Harper Adams University. Now, I don't have a background in weed management. My PhD was looking at the interaction of traffic and tillage on soil physical properties and crop yields. But I think, um, you know, we can we can see lots of links between soil management and weed management. So um, as, as well as I don't come at it from a, from a weed perspective, rather a soil perspective, hopefully we can, we can see some of those links as we go through the presentations. So what Judith asked me to present on today is really just a short update to set the scene in terms of HDB weeds research. And across HDB, our research investment across the arable sector in terms of managing weeds is really looking at the prevent, detect and control strategies that farmers, growers and agronomists can implement as part of an overall integrated pest management strategy. So at HDB we've got a number of funded research projects looking at weeds and you can read more about all of these projects in our latest arable review that has just been published. This is available to download from the downloads area in this session so if you just scroll down below the video you'll be able to find that there. And you can also access it through our website where you can also, um, also have a, a, um, a hard copy delivered directly to your door so you can order that there. So one of the projects that I want to highlight today is a five year research project that's actually coming to an end this year. And this project is looking at managing the resistance risk to retain long term effectiveness of glyphosate for grass weed control in UK crop rotations. So the main grass weeds that were tested within this research project were black grass and Italian rye grass. And the research project looked at two risk periods of glyphosate application and those two risk periods of pre-drilling and post-emergence. So one of the goals of the project was to quantify the need for repeat applications on stubble or pre-drilling and also determine the ways to mitigate risk using alternative management practices such as cultivation. So I've listed some of the key messages that are coming out of the research project, and these include a focus on the timing of application, dose, and also temperature. And another key message is around cultivation. So as I already said, you know, soil management is, is a key point in weed management, and this research project links directly to some of the work that we're doing on one of our strategic cereal farms. So our strategic cereal farm in the west is hosted by Rob Fox just outside Leamington Spa at Squawpool Farms. And he was really interested to look at alternatives to glyphosate use for managing blackgrass. So he farms on, on varied soil types, predominantly, predominantly quite heavy clays, Warwickshire clays. And he was really interested to look at the use of different cultivation strategies either to eliminate or to reduce his reliance on glyphosate and look at how he could use cultural controls in combination 
with the chemical controls. So before I go on and talk you through the trial that we're looking at, at the Strategic Cereal Farm West, I really have to give all of the credit for this presentation to Sarah Cook from ADAS. So we're working with Sarah on the Strategic Farm Project on the weed assessments and the weed trial at Rob's this year. And you can find out more about this project by listening back to our Strategic Farm Week webinars that were hosted a couple of weeks ago. And, and Sarah very kindly delivered um, a lot of this presentation during that webinar. So that the purpose today is really to, to provide you an overview, a summary of that, of those uh, key messages that she shared with us. So, so all credit due to Sarah for, for this presentation. So what you can see here is the layout of the weed management trial at the Strategic Cereal Farm West. And you can see that we've got three treatments here. So we've got the farm standard, which is shown in blue. So that's the power harrow and glyphosate. We've then got the duck foot spring thyme with no glyphosate shown in the grey. And then we've got the third and final treatment shown in green, which is the Vardastat Coltus Quattro. And again, that doesn't have any um, glyphosate applied. The underlying soil type in this field is quite varied. We've got large areas of lighter and heavier soil types. And the results that we're, we're seeing from the initial blackgrass and weed assessments at the time of cultivation um, and the application of these treatments we're really starting to see the, the influence and the role of those varied soil types in, in some of the numbers that we're getting. But as you can see here on the slide, we've got a range of assessments that we're conducting across the year um, and obviously taking this trial all the way through to yield as well for um, harvest 2021. So if we have a look at some of the, um, the weed level results pre-treatment, so on the 18th of September, the cultivations were done and the researchers reported that black grass levels were actually quite low at this point. The main area of <clears throat> black grass was found on the headland of the tram line rather than on any of the treatment tram lines. But there were evidence and presence of other weeds um, in the field. So including cleavers, charlock and groundsel were also found. So the cultivations were done, as I said, on the 18th of September, and then the additional um, cultivation treatments were repeated again at the end of the month on the 30th. And then the whole field was drilled on the 1st of October. So what you can see here on the slide is um, the three treatments. So along the top row, we've got a photo of the treatments being applied to the trial. And then the bottom row is the um, photos taken of the, the soil surface, the tilth that has been created as a result of those different cultivation treatments. So you can see our first treatment, which is the farm standard on the left hand side of the slide. So that's the power harrow and glyphosate combination. And the depth of this cultivation ranged from between three to eight centimetres. So quite shallow, keeping that seed in the top layer of the seed bed. And you can see from the photo directly underneath on the left hand side that we've got good tilth and a small crumb size has been created as a result of that power harrow treatment. The researchers noted that all of the spring volunteers were quite well destroyed and they were lifted out of the soil and left on the surface to dry. If we have a look at the springtime treatment in the centre of the slide, so that's the springtime with the duck foot and no glyphosate. So this treatment was repeated twice so on the 18th and then again on the 30th of September. The picture is actually taken from the first cultivation timing, um, which was the, the depth which was around four to seven centimetres. So again, still keeping that depth of cultivation shallow, not bringing up any of those populations from depth that are probably in the seed bank. This, this field does have a history of black grass. What, we, what the researchers um, noted was this actually tended to leave the soil in mini ridges. And you can see that there in that photo in the middle on the bottom line. And it didn't actually manage to remove all of the volunteers. And then if we have a look at our third and final treatment, you can see that there on the right hand side. So this is the Vardastat Coltus Quattro with no glyphosate. And here we really started to see the, um, 
the difference in weed management achieved as a result of variations in cultivation depth. So the depth here ran mostly at around four to eight centimetres, but they did find that that increased up to 10 centimetres in some of the lighter soils. So going back to that variation in soil type across the field and only two centimetres on some of the heavier parts of the field. So here we're beginning to introduce problems with that variable depth of cultivation. And you can see from the photo in the bottom right hand corner, the quality of the seed bed. We've got some much larger clod sizes and we've got a, a greater level of surviving spring barley volunteers. You can see those there in that photo. So without the use of glyphosate in this situation, some of those volunteers could be difficult to control. So as I said, there were a number of other um, weeds found in the field assessments and cleavers were found in quite high numbers in certain areas of the field, predominantly in the shallow soil over sandstone and on the medium, um, the medium loam soil as well. In terms of black grass, as I said, the history, the, the field has a history of quite bad black grass, but actually there wasn't a lot. Um, when the when the assessments were done on the 18th of September. But what the researchers have reported is obviously there's still that chance or this, there still was that chance um, for them to emerge if it's not if it wasn't currently present. So, as I said, this this um, strategic farm trial links really nicely to that research project that I highlighted at the start, and it's part of a much bigger HDB glyphosate project and what this project is really showing us is the value of an autumn cultivation. So you can see here we've got three different glyphosate timings, we've got no glyphosate, autumn glyphosate and spring glyphosate and this is in a spring barley crop and then on the vertical axes we've got the number of black grass plants per meter squared and you can see the role of a cultivation at all of those glyphosate timings so even you know where we have got glyphosate and when we haven't got glyphosate the the importance of that November cultivation can be seen here in the graph so you can see on that November cultivation where, we, where we've done that November cultivation the number of black grass plants per meter squared is reduced so I mentioned the arable review so this is something that we produce on an annual basis it's an overview of the research project across the arable um, offering, so covering both cereals and all seeds and potato sectors. You can find out more about the weed research on pages eight and nine of the arable review. Um, and of course, happy, happy to take any questions as we go through the presentations today. Thank you, Judith, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Emily, don't go too far away. There is a question which um, has just come in. <laughs> Why did you choose not to plough in the trial? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting interesting question. Probably one I'd have to I'd have to um, ask Rob in terms of his his soil management strategies. I think from the work that we've done with Rob to date, he's he's looking at moving away from those intensive cultivations and looking at how we can manage both his soil management and his weed management using cultivation strategies that don't um, disturb the, the soil profile as much. So I agree, I think, you know, it's, it has its role, doesn't it, as we all know, in terms of burying that weed seed deeper in, in the um, soil profile and then adopting maybe minimum tillage strategies to, to keep it down there. But, yeah, I think I think it's... Um, it's probably that motivation to reduce cultivations. Thank you. Right at that, I think we're ready to move on to Chloe's presentation. So, um, Chloe's joining us from New Zealand, um, where I believe it's about quarter past six uh, on Tuesday morning. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Thanks, Judith. Um, yep, it's pretty early on the side of the world, um, but all good over here. Um, so today I'd like to share with you um, some new ways of thinking about weeds. Um, these have been inspired by some recent research um, and we're hoping that they're going to lead to more successful weed management in the future. Maybe I can change slides, that would be very helpful. Right, 
Um, today in the talk, I'd like to go over why it is that I think we need new ways of thinking about weeds, what it is that we should be thinking, and then how we can start putting um, some of these ideas into practice. Although I'm very hopeful that Steve and David, who are speaking after me, um, will have some more practical ideas on that for you. So why do we need new ways of thinking about weeds? Um, the first point is that we are still struggling with weed control. So currently around the world, we have more than 260 weed species that are resistant to um, more than, also between them, they're resistant to most of the chemicals that we have. So there's a real possibility of super weeds um, developing from these, this group of species that are resistant that may eventually, we may run out of chemicals that we can use to control them. Um, resistance can be very expensive. So currently it's estimated that the cost of resistant black grass in winter wheat when you take into account the cost of yield loss to that black grass and the cost of additional herbicides or measures that have been taken to try to control that, it can cost between 75 and 450 pounds per hectare, um, which is obviously not ideal for farmers. Um, and the more we study this problem, the trickier it seems to be getting. So we used to think that if you mixed herbicides, so you mixed two active ingredients together, then that would prevent resistance from developing. Then um, as time went on, we realized resistance was still evolving in those conditions. And this year, um, new recent research from colleagues at Rothamsted is showing that although mixing herbicides does delay target site resistance, so it delays um, weeds becoming resistant to a single mode of action, in the long run, it actually promotes the development of cross resistance. So it promotes mechanisms in weeds that mean they can generally avoid absorbing chemicals or they're better able to get um, detoxify those chemicals um, before it causes mortality. So that's not great news. Um, but it's not just herbicides. So if we look around our farming systems, then weeds that are generally tolerant or good at avoiding control are increasingly common. They do this through strategies such as variable germination times, so that no matter when you spray or you till, the weeds, some of them will still pop up afterwards. And some of them have increasingly short growth periods, so they're growing quickly and rapidly in periods between when you can apply any effective control. Um, and the more problematic these weeds become, the more expensive it is. Um, so that's in terms of having to spend more on control in terms of chemicals, time, energy, fuel, or in terms of having to accept more crop loss from these problematic weeds. Um, then on top of us not really doing well at keeping up with the weeds, um, often the harder that we try to control them, the more damage we're doing to our farmland. So as I'm sure most people know, um, regular and intensive tillage um, is a major contributor to unsustainable levels of soil erosion. Um, there's some research showing that both tillage and herbicides can affect soil microbes, um, particularly mycorrhizae. I don't think we know enough about it yet to really know if that translates to a change or a loss in function from those microbes. But I would say that it suggests that we want to be a little bit careful about how often we're using either of those tools. Um, and last, of course, weeds do actually provide positive functions for farmland as well. Um, they contribute to protecting soil, to cycling nutrients through soil, um, and they can interact with the uh, beneficial insects on the farm. So if you remove all of the weeds, then you're losing those functions even if you're also getting rid of the competition. Um, and then of course, we need to worry a little bit about the off-farm impacts of weeds. So recently there's been a lot of discussion around um, glyphosate and the effects of glyphosate and other herbicides on human health. Um, I don't want to get into that debate, but I think no matter which side of it you're on, we can all agree that the fact that that concern exists means that there's a real possibility that some of these chemicals will be banned or heavily restricted in future and we're going to need to learn to manage weeds with less chemistry. Um, and then of course, um, removing weeds is a major cause of biodiversity loss in farmland. So it's particularly critical for birds. So very dependent on the variety um, of weed seeds that used to exist. So I would say that it seems that um, things like pigeons are doing quite well off our crop seed, but perhaps all of the, the diversity of small finches and things that we might prefer, um, they really need the weed seeds. And then of course, some of the weeds themselves are starting to disappear as our systems become more and more intense and it's harder for them to survive. So I'd say we can sum that up with the statement that we're losing the war on weeds. Weeds are extremely adaptable. So the more we study them, the more likely it seems that they will always win. The harder we try to control them, often 
the more damage we're doing to our farmland. And as we do that, we're taking everything else down with us. So I think we really need some new ways of thinking about weeds. Which brings me to the question of what should we be thinking about weeds? I'm gonna make a big statement here. I'm gonna say that what I think we really need to do is stop trying to get rid of all the weeds. Instead, we should be aiming to farms that are resilient to problematic weeds. So we don't want huge problems, of, um, huge populations of things like black grass, but we do want farms that can foster a diverse community of wild plants, so a diverse community of weeds. And we would like farms where the benefits that we gain from these weeds outweigh any costs of having them there. But hang on, I'm sure you're thinking, don't, don't we get rid of weeds for a really good reason? Don't they compete with our crops and cause yield loss? Um, and that's true, but it may not always be as true as we might think. And the key point here is that weed diversity is associated with reduced competition between weeds and crops. So we have some evidence for this from Rothamsted, from one of our long-term trials, um, where some researchers compared um, plots that were equivalent, except that one of those plots had been sprayed with a herbicide or several herbicides, and one of them hadn't been treated. They then compared the yield in each of those plots, and what they found was that when the unsprayed plot had more weed species, then its yield loss relative to the sprayed plot was much less. So you can see on this graph here that um, when you only had five to six weed species, that yield loss was up around 60 to 70 percent, but by the time you got closer to 20 weed species, that had dropped to 30 to 40 percent. Quite a big difference. There's another study from France, and they also have a long-term experiment. They have different cropping systems in this long-term experiment. And in each of these cropping systems, a different weed community has developed over time in response to the different management they've used. And so the researchers went into these different weed communities and they set up unweeded plots. Um, so plots where they just let everything grow that wanted to grow, and then zero weed plots. This wasn't just, you know, treated and left. They really made sure they pulled every single weed out of these pots. Um, and what they found, so they had six distinct weed communities in these different management systems. And four out of those six weed communities did what you might expect, and they decreased yields between 20 and 55%. But two of the weed communities had absolutely no effect on yields at all. So no weeds were taken out, no crop loss. Um, the researchers also found that yield loss decreased as weed diversity increased. So these communities that had um, no effect on yields tended to be very diverse. And they found that yield loss was not strongly related to the number of weeds. It was much more strongly related to the diversity of weeds. And then finally, they found that the composition of those weed communities affected the yield loss somewhat as well. So if you had a community that was dominated by something like black grass or cleavers, you did lose yield, but if you had a nice diverse community with good representation of things like speedwell and field pansy, um, then there was not so much yield loss or no yield loss at all. So we can conclude from this that when we're concerned about yield loss from weeds, the question is not how weedy is the field, the question is which weeds are there and how many different species are there. The same question is very important for ecosystem function and for biodiversity support. So the more weeds you have out there, the more likely it is that they're performing a variety of positive services for your soils um, and supporting beneficial insects and supporting a wider range of diversity. So I think this is really interesting because this gives us a common goal um, between reducing yield loss and increasing um, the capacity of farms to conserve nature. So the more weed diversity we have, the less yield loss we have and the better um, situation we have for our biodiversity and soil functioning. We can further enhance this balance by aiming, so we're aiming for a diverse community of weeds, but we can um, aim for a diverse community of a certain type of weed. And these types of weeds, short weeds, slow growing weeds that tend to have large seeds and, um, and large flowers, uh, they tend to be less competitive with crops while also providing more services to biodiversity. So if we aim for a diverse community of these types of weeds, then we're likely to minimize competition whilst maximizing their positive benefits. Here are some examples of the types of weeds that we might want. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's just to give you an idea um, of the sort of the growth forms um, and some of the species that you might have seen. 
Um, so they're all low growing, most of them are flowering um, and they tend to be slow growing. So a lot of these you'll see that the, they flower later in the season and produce seed later in the season. And they have high value um, to birds and insects. Um, unfortunately, what we usually see when we walk out onto a farm is not a nice diversity of all those small sort of friendly um, slow growing weeds. But if we walk into an arable farm, we're likely to see a lot of black grass and wild oats. If you walk out into pasture, it's often a lot of dock and creeping thistle. What these weeds have in common is that they're all very tall. They're all very fast growing. They're very competitive with the crops or the pasture, but not just with that. They're also very competitive with other weeds. So if you have a lot of something like black grass, you're unlikely to have a lot of those other small, um, more diverse weeds that might be more beneficial because black grass is competing with them as well as the crop. So the situation is not ideal. What do we do about it? Um, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to tell you in quite theoretical and general terms what a, re um, a weed resistant farm will look like and a farm that can look after some of that diversity that we want. Um, putting it into practice um, might be a little trickier. So a lot of this, um, a lot of the ways that you would put this into practice and a lot of the solutions to weed management are going to be quite specific to the environment you're in, to the weather you have, the types of weeds that occur naturally, and also what types of crops you're growing or what types of animals you have. And this is something that farmers and not scientists or the agronomists and farmers are experts on. Um, so what I'm really hoping is that if I can share the, the theory behind this weed management, then some of you will be able to come up with your own um, ways of putting this into practice and then hopefully share those back with us too. Um, so I think the easiest way of explaining uh, how to do weed management successfully is to explain where it all goes wrong and explain what not to do. So what I have here on this slide is a cropping season going from um, sowing on the left through to harvest on the right. And the first point I'd like to make is that we need to try to avoid consistently penalizing weeds for being different to the crop. So generally at the beginning of the season, we clean the field. So we might have a few weeds that have come up before we want to sow the crop, we get rid of them. Okay, then we sow the crop. Um, a few weeds will come up with that crop, so that's what weeds do. Um, and then we might be looking at the crop and we might think, oh, it needs a bit of fertilizer or irrigation or something to get going. And so we'll give it, give it those resources, but that will benefit the weeds as well. And it particularly benefits weeds um, that like to have those resources available in the same way that the crops do. So they respond well and grow more quickly um, when those resources are applied. We then might look at that field and think, well, hang on a minute, um, it's getting a bit weedy, and um, we'd better try and do something about that. But we're in the crop now, so we tend to um, only have a few control methods available, and they tend to get rid of weeds that are different to the crop. Um, so different in terms of the metabolism or the growth form. And what that means is we've ended up with some weeds that are very similar to the crop. They want, are using the same um, or they're benefiting from the same resources, so the fertilizers and the irrigation. They have a similar growth form to the crop, potentially a similar metabolism. And what that means is that those weeds um, are going to compete more with the crops because they want the same resources at the same time as your crop. Um, and that's not great news. And if we can't control them in the crop because they're too similar to the crop, then they'll keep going through to the um, end of the season. There'll be not much we can do about it. Um, a few weeds might, sort of these nicer, more beneficial weeds might pop up towards the end of the season. But if harvest is lethal to those weeds, um, like through a harvest desiccant or through cleaning the field after harvest, and if that occurs before they seed, then they'll be lost from the system. So you'll lose those benefits. What happens then if we do the same thing again? So we've grown the same crop more than one year in a row. The weeds survived last year because they were similar to the crop. They avoided our control. It's going to be more weed seed in the soil to come up at the beginning. They still like those fertilizers or that irrigation. They're going to respond well to that. We still can't control them. And so every year, the number of weeds in the, of the, or the number of that type of weed in the system will increase. Then furthermore, we try to, when we're farming, create a really nice environment for our crops so that they grow well. But unfortunately, we often also create a really nice environment for our weeds. Um, so this is particularly exacerbated if you sow a poorly competitive cultivar because that means the weeds will get off to um, you know, a good start in life with no competition. 
Then we fertilize or we irrigate. So there's loads of resources there. The weeds don't have to worry. They're not stressed. They're not trying to get hold of nutrients and moisture. Um, so they can just put all their effort into growing quickly. We've sprayed pesticides. There's nothing eating the crop, but there's also nothing eating the weeds. The same goes for fungicides and pathogens. And so what you'll end up at the end of the season is a lot, a lot of weeds that can produce a lot of biomass. They can produce a lot of weed seed. Um, and it's easier for them to evolve resistance under these conditions because all they have to worry about, the only selection pressure occurring on, to those weeds, um, is, is whatever control that we're trying to use. Um, and the more weed seed that is produced, the more kind of chances there are for some of those offspring um, to, be, to have traits that make them resistant to control. So the key points from that to keep in mind um, are that repetitive, strong control efforts can remove weed diversity whilst promoting resistant weeds that mimic the crop and are therefore particularly competitive with the crop. And also that when we have a resource rich enemy free environment, this helps weeds to survive control and to adapt to it. Right, so what can we do about that? Um, we've got four principles of ecological weed management here. These aim to both sustain agricultural production, so to keep crop or pasture production high, but also to conserve um, our biodiversity and the environment. These four principles are to increase diversity, to use little hammers, not sledgehammers, to minimize resource availability, and to take advantage of the positive effects of weeds. Um, a really important point about these four principles is that none of them should be done just for weeds. All of these principles um, should contribute to a sustainable farming on a wider scale. So they should be also be useful for pest and pathogen management. They should increase your nutrient use efficiency and hopefully in the long run, they'll minimize input and management costs. So the first principle is to increase diversity in all its forms. Um, and when I say all its forms, I really mean all the forms. So anything you can think of, um, crops, management, livestock, can you integrate livestock and crops? What habitats have you got on the farm? What's going on in the soil? What insects are around? Um, and the more diversity um, of all of these things that you can have in both time and in space, the better. Um, and so why, why do we want diversity? Well, if we change the type and timing of practices and conditions between fields across the farm and on the same field in each year, then it means that no single weed species is likely to do well in every field or in every year. So that means that something like blackgrass is unlikely um, to increase its population every year. Equally, we might hope that not, um, not all weeds will be suppressed every year. So if we have something that's a bit more sensitive, um, like a cornflower, um, although it might not survive something that you do to one field in one year, there may be refugia on the farm where the um, management's less intensive um, in some places or in some years so that those weeds can reproduce and survive a little bit better. Um, it's also true that crop and habitat diversity promote natural enemies of weeds, so the organisms that will help um, you to keep on top of the weeds. This seems to be particularly true for seed predators, so carabid beetles their populations and activity respond quite strongly to habitat diversity. Um, and then how do we increase diversity? Well, as I said before, anything you can think of, mixing crops, um, rotating crops, integrating crops and livestock, putting in something like a lay, which is quite a different type of crop to a, um, an arable crop, or vice versa, put arable crops into your pastures um, every few years, and then try to get the, um, the diversity in those habitats around the fields. So the second principle is um, to use little hammers, not sledgehammers for weed management. So I would guess that most people have heard before um, that with weed management, we should use many little hammers. So lots of different tactics that target weeds um, at different points in their life cycle um, and will target lots of different weeds at lots of different points in their life cycle to um, obtain good control. And so what's becoming really important, uh, what's becoming increasingly obvious is that these are little hammers many little hammers and not sledgehammers. What I mean by that is that we shouldn't be trying to kill all the weeds at the same time every time, because when we do that, we just create this really strong selection pressure for any weed that can survive that joint control. So again, we tend to get these weeds that avoid control at the beginning of the season, 
and that mimic our crops sufficiently that any control we try to use in the crop isn't going to work for those weeds. Um, and how we use little hammers is we want to use as many different things. We want to, or we want to change things between years as much as possible. So if you've got four or five different ways you can control weeds, can you use two of them in one year, two of them in another year? Um, you know, one of them randomly in different years around that. Um, and it's easier to do this the more diversity we have. So particularly crop diversity, um, because as you change crops from year to year, that naturally changes the timings and the types of management that are used. So that's sort of not a, it's not an additional thing that you're doing for weed management. Um, and the other form of a, a little hammer is um, to use precision control. So if it's possible just to spray um, something like black grass or dock to spot spray, then you're not applying that selection pressure for resistance to the whole field. So you might have a few um, black grass plants that escape that control, but those plants can survive whilst being susceptible to herbicides. And then those susceptible genetics can dilute any resistant genetics that develop in the sprayed spots. Um, so you should, you should retain easier to manage black grass in the long run. Um, so that brings me to just interrupt myself here with a quick note on herbicides. Um, herbicides are obviously one of our main tools for weed control. So I think it's important to um, understand how these principles apply to herbicides. Um, and I think the really important point here is that we need to be careful not to use herbicide diversity as a sledgehammer. So um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, um, herbicide mixes can be very effective at removing weeds, um, but they are essentially a large hammer, so they kill a lot of weeds. Um, and then they increase the selection pressure for weeds that can survive those multiple modes of action, those multiple herbicides. So I'm not saying don't use herbicide mixes, because if we don't use mixes, then um, target site resistance does develop more easily. But in an ideal world, um, and I've no, I don't really know how realistic this is, but maybe Steve or David will have some ideas later, but can we alternate herbicide mixes with years where we're not using herbicides at all? Can we put in things like lays that don't require so much management to give the system a break from the chemistry so that resistance um, and problematic weeds are not favoured through the use of that, those control techniques? Another option might be to really restrict yourself to precision applications. Um, so that whilst you might be using a large hammer on a small spot, it is just that small area that's affected. So the third principle um, is to minimize resource availability. Um, and what I mean by that is reducing the amount of free light and nutrients and moisture that are available to weeds. And so why that's important is, well, firstly, just the more available resources you have, the more weeds you'll have that have the opportunity to grow and use those resources. But on top of that, if you have a really high resource availability, you select for weeds that like to use those resources. So weeds that have a strategy of growing really quickly and trying to grab all of those resources before the crop can. Um, and that means that if they've got that particular life strategy, they're likely to be very competitive with the crops because they're aiming to get to those resources first. On the other hand, if you have low resource availability, you tend to get weeds that, are, that grow more slowly, they're more patient and they're less competitive for the resources, more kind of um, tolerant of the crops being there and not competing with the crops. Um, how do we achieve this? Um, probably the, the best way to do it is to try to give your crops the advantage so that they can take up all of those resources before the weeds can. And you can do that through using competitive cultivars and through mixing complementary crops together. Um, where possible, it's also great if um, any resources that are applied, such as fertilizer and irrigation, if these can be placed um, in space and in time where it makes it easier for the crops um, to get hold of those resources before the weeds do, that's going to help. Um, it might be useful to use slow release nutrients. So often if you put down a lot of fertilizer, there's a big flush of nitrogen. If the crops are too small to use that, um, then the weeds will get hold of it and use it themselves first. Um, and then, of course, the more you can keep the soil covered using mulches or intercrops or crop residues, um, then the harder it is for weed seedlings to establish through that layer that stops light from reaching the soil. And the last principle is to take advantage of the positive effects of weeds. Um, they, they do have positive effects, and the more we progress towards a, a diverse community of non-competitive species, the more we're likely to appreciate those benefits 
in greater amounts relative to the costs of having weeds. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Um, and how we do that is if we follow all of the other um, principles, then we should um, be moving towards having these more diverse, less competitive weed communities. So just to sum that all up, um, I think whenever we go out to do any type of weed control, we should always be asking ourselves two key questions. And the first thing is, what effect will this control have on future weeds? By controlling these weeds now, am I creating a situation that promotes worse weeds? Um, so am I doing something that um, increases resource availability or um, that creates a really strong selection pressure for weeds to escape this management and become more resistant to it in the future? We should also consider the rest of the agroecosystem. So we can go out there and spray and plow and everything as much as we want and we might have absolutely no weeds, but if we do that every year, year in, year out, then a few years later, what have we done to the soil? Um, and how, how does that balance against the cost of having those weeds versus the cost of trying to get rid of them? So hopefully these four principles that I've explained can help um, answer those questions. Whenever you get out there, you can, you can think about how those practices might fit into what I've just described. Um, and then hopefully that will help us to reach this aim of having farms that are resilient to problematic competitive weeds, but that are capable of sustaining wild plant diversity and where we gain more benefits from those weeds than they cost us. And, and that's all. Thanks very much, everyone. I think we'll take some questions. We do have some questions that have come for you, Chloe. You've just actually answered one of them. One of them was what would be the main take home message uh, messages for your segment. You have just done that. But the, I think I'll slip one in here before we hand over to Steve. How can you create a beneficial environment for your crop without creating a beneficial environment for the weed? I think, you know, particularly when you're there thinking about the most problematic weeds, what would you say to that one? Um, so that is a good question and potentially quite a tricky one to answer. Um, part, part of that answer is can the crop um, create the environment that's not beneficial? So where can you use more competitive crops that are able to take those resources away before the weeds? Can... And the second thing is thinking about this diversity. So if you're creating a benefit for one crop and that's going to favor weeds that like to live alongside that um, and interact with the system in the same way that crop. But if you change every year, you're a different crop in the second year, then the weeds that first crop are unlikely to do so well. So the classic example of that is going from an autumn sown crop to a spring sown crop. And these favor completely different species of weeds. So you're able to, by switching to a spring sown crop, you can reduce those autumn germinating weeds like black grass. Okay. Thank you, Chloe. I will save the others for the end. And I think at that point, we'll move over to Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I've got the slot to follow that, or try to, and ask the question, is this actually possible in practice? Well, I'm sure some of it is, but let's go back to what our weed control aims are to start with. The aim, of course, is to avoid yield losses because, after all, we get paid for what grain we produce. So we need to produce as much as possible, as cheap as possible. So well as avoiding yield losses, we also have to look at optimising the grower's margin. So that's the agronomist's job. But we also need to look at avoiding building up problems, which is perhaps something we haven't been um, avoiding at the moment, but I'll come on to that a bit later. We also need to avoid quality losses, because weeds in the crop can lead to contamination, taints, um, higher moisture contents, maybe a greater level of cleaning required. So all these things have to be taken into account as well. And also avoiding any harvest delays. So we get to um, seem to be getting more and more difficult Augusts. And also, as was alluded to earlier, avoid environmental problems of soil erosion, um, pesticides in water, etc. 
because that leads to other issues. And probably enhancing biodiversity is at the, the lower end of what we're trying to do than the bottom at the moment, but things could change. The observations, I would say, from the years of doing this job, I think farmers have got a lower weed tolerance than they used to have. And it's something that um, will, might be counterproductive to this argument, but it does seem that people want to have cleaner crops. The old adages of one year's we uh, seeds is 10 years weeds. And there's also a bit of perhaps pride involved there as well. So there seems to be a lower weed tolerance. Problems, of course, have built up. We have been using some pretty big sledgehammers. We have been um, pushing things perhaps a bit too hard and maybe taking away some of that crop biodiversity and having poorer rotations. And we have certainly been increasing herbicide applications. And we've gone from perhaps one in the autumn, one in the spring, to more like two in the autumn and, and then probably another two in the spring. So we have been hitting things much harder and being more very very much more intense in what we're doing, which is always perhaps a bit, perhaps being a bit too harsh, but we've had to. And also I'm seeing increased combine speeds and widths. And with that comes trying to get the job done quicker, is you can't afford any delays. These combines are very expensive. They have to be working at their capacity to get things done. And while combines have been invested in, I haven't seen the same investment going on farm in cleaning and drying facilities. However, the combines have been doing a much better job of cleaning things up, going through, you know, through them. There isn't so much weed in there, but they still need clean crops to do that job. But they are doing a far better job. And nobody wants to be cleaning grain now. It takes too much time. All the facilities are too slow. And again, with drying as well, it's another cost. Everything's a cost. So it's a case of keep it clean. I th seem to think we also have been having greater food standards. Maybe we haven't, but it seems that Evermore wanted to have um, better quality product. We are producing a food at the end of the day, so it has to be free from contamination. But could we leave some weeds? Well, in theory, we could try and leave the least competitive weeds. And it's certainly something we could certainly look at. And Try and leave those with biodiversity benefits. Obviously, that comes hand in hand. You know, the things with biodiversity benefits are pansies, fumitory, chickweed, speedwells, vetches, clovers. Yeah, they probably could be left. You wouldn't want to leave any sort of like bindweed, docks, fat hen, mayweed, knotgrass, say thistles, poppies, and that's without going into um, brome and blackgrass. Through a level of those which would be acceptable. And um, looking at stimulus uh, tables, these are you know, pigs from AHDB as it happens, but these are the amounts of plants you, that would lead to a 5% yield loss in wheat. So the very competitive things like bromes and wild oats, you only need 0 to 5 per square meter to take out 5% of the yield of wheat. And black grass, 12 to 17, etc., and so on, you go down. What you see is the, the least competitive ones, you need quite high numbers to actually lose 5% yield. But is 5% acceptable to farmers? Possibly not. Maybe 1% or 2%. So um, if we can lose perhaps 1% of yield, we could leave quite a few of those in the bottom category, the, the fumit trees and cranes bill, etc. Um, that could be possible. And um, fill pansies. But of course, yield loss isn't the only factor. It's also grain quality, combining speeds, etc. So I think we'd only probably find that the odd weed from the bottom two groups would be acceptable on farm. Um, but if we can avoid having the ones in the top and just have a few of them in the bottom, maybe we can do that. And maybe that's where the crop biodiversity comes in, just having different crops within the rotation. Okay, back to could we leave some weeds? practice what we're doing at the moment in removing the most competitive weeds like the black grass we're also removing the least competitive so it becomes a bit more difficult we're having large autumn residual stacks for black grass if you're mixing pendomethylene and diflufenacan at quite high rates you don't leave a great deal of broadleaf weeds behind so you're not leaving anything for um 
that biodiversity. And as we become more and more intense in those stacks, and perhaps doing them twice, then we're leaving even less. And, and even in the spring, looking at broadleaf weed control for cleavers and charlock, they're the more competitive ones, but we're often using quite broad spectrum materials, you know, like so zip R and uh, Spitfire, and even for some things, Ally Max and that sort of thing. If you're mixing these products together, we're getting some very heavy well, sledgehammers, as Clay called them. And the other problem we have is that weeds aren't usually in a uniform low population across the field. So it's quite difficult to leave something um, when there may be patches which tend to be, it might, might be higher that we may not have walked across to or seen. So it's quite difficult from our point of view to maybe leave that um, population. There's always going to be a higher population somewhere or maybe. So we tend to hear on the side of caution and take things out. We also have to look at where the future is, and we may have to leave some weeds in the future. It's something we may have to do, get the money, if we can show something's there. We are facing this sort of new dawn for agriculture in the UK. Um, may seem more like the morning after the night before, but we'll have to see what it brings and what it pays for and what it's not going to pay for and what they really want. And actually, if weeds are seen as a um, public good, then we could be paid to grow them. And in my experience, farmers, if they're paid to grow something, they generally grow it. So it's something we could see. And if that's what the public want, we may be happy to do so. And also sustainable farming systems could mean fewer herbicides to be applied. That's absolutely fine. Um, but also we keep losing more and more herbicides because we're not looking after them. If we could putting on high doses of things, they will be found in watercourses. So we have to be farming in a sustainable way. I know Chloe is talking about lots of little hammers. That sounds like more applications and that may not be quite as sustainable when you're trying to reduce carbon footprints and that sort of thing. But lower doses could be. It's just how many times we want to go through the crop as well. So it may be we should be looking at fewer herbicide applications as well as lower doses. And we could certainly make some less broad spectrum product choices at times. We could be just using fluoroxypire or fluorazulam for cleavers and leave a few other things as well. But in general, we have a mixed weed population, so we tend to be using quite broad spectrum pro product choices. we could be looking at um, companions for wildlife in the future or even cover crops in between which will give some biodiversity and that would make a lot of sense companion crops to growing fertility yes if we can get a clover or something that will boost some nitrogen um, then maybe we could um, we have got to consider harvesting difficulties as well and how we overcome those without perhaps glyphosate in the future. And is it better to have a clean crop and set aside areas for the wildlife? So they have designated areas where there's a lot of them, or is it better to have a low level of wildlife throughout the crop? Probably the latter, but the former might be more appropriate, um, amenable to the farmers. So that's something we have to sort of consider. And should we really be calling weeds weeds? non-crop non arable plants might be a better terminology. Weeds suggest they're weak. And in my opinion, weeds aren't weak. They're actually very vigorous and resilient. And I think the amount of nitrogen we're putting on is just encouraging the ones which like a lot of nitrogen and they become our more competitive plants. So maybe we've got to find the right balance between how we manage the crop, how we manage the soil, and therefore how we manage the weeds. So it's something we can look at. In answer to the question, is it possible to grow um, to ecologically weed manage? Yes, it probably is possible. And for some farms, it'd be more possible than others. And I think it's up to the farmers to how they want to farm, what they want to see, but as well as whatever policy allows us to do or wants us to do at the same time. So um, 
cropped up biodiversity certainly is possible and therefore maybe some weed biodiversity too okay that was kind of... and so i'll now pass on to david who's probably a little bit further down the line and trying to get off the treadmill of ever more herbicides thank you lovely thank you very much steve um good evening everyone um, yes, we're down in Hampshire. We're farming around about 700 hectares of grey tree ground, which is uh, all over chalk with plenty of clay cap and a lot of flints. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I haven't been asked to do this presentation. I thought I'd better have a look at a, a bit of background. And uh, I found that actually herbicides didn't really start to be used until after World War II, so around about 1945, when they were developed as miracle weed killers. Um, and they were the likes of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, which um, really are consigned to the past. Um, but chemicals were originally uh, meant for weed control, but only, um, according to one of the German pioneers, as a, an auxiliary to cultural control, never to be used on their own. So I think what we've found now is um, we have mostly got a reactive system for uh, for applying herbicides, um, which really is, um, in his words, applying enough poison to kill the weed without hurting the crop too much. <clears throat> well, that um, also has an impact on, on the soil, on the biodiversity in the soil, which we are failing to be able to measure much at the moment. So what I want to do is to just give you a, a farmer's perspective on the practical things that we're working on at the moment to try and ease the pressure on these pesticides. Um, so there's four things that I'd like to cover, um, zero soil disturbance, companion crops, cover crops, and also a little bit on non-chemical weed destruction. So these are all things that we're trying to get involved into. Um, we've been no-till on the farm for six years. Everything has been no-till um, and we've been using the cover crops as well. So gr drilling into green cover crops. Um, of which there is a number of drills that are really good at doing this now. Um, so what we're finding is that actually we're, we're reducing the seed bank. So we're not bringing up any more seeds through cultivation. So the seed bank is staying put. So hopefully once we've got to, uh, as Steve said, 10 years of, of seeding, that we will actually be leaving those seeds dead in the bottom of the soil on the soil profile um, and we're certainly finding that to a degree over the last six years um, we found a reduction in weeds um, especially the more competitive ones black grass being the key one um, but we've also seen that there's been a shift in species so the weed species the weed spectrum that we're needing to control is changing slightly and very interesting to hear chloe talking about these um, the less competitive weeds and we're finding a number of those are becoming more prevalent in the in the in the uh, in the crops that we're growing. So um, this is what we're trying to look at as we are drilling cover crops, etc., into a um, a stubble. So we're trying to leave any weed seeds from the previous crop on the surface, which is um, then enabling more natural methods so we're finding birds are eating some of these seeds and a natural decline in the viability through um, some of them chitting and, and not being able to grow um, so really it's the weeds that we've already got we're trying not to affect the, the seed bank that we've got within the soil and, and this isn't a, a quick one-year process you know do it one year and then you see a result this is something that actually has to evolve over quite a lot of time so this slide is um, a, a contract job we had of putting some oats and vetch um, in for a neighbor's sheep um, so the this grass lay has been sprayed off it hasn't actually started to senesce yet but it's been sprayed off and we're putting the, the oats and vetch into that with the with the disc drill um, the alternative that he would have to consider would be to plough that, in which he'd have to plough it, cultivate it, and lose all the moisture, um, and also open up that seed bank again. And, and this is what it actually looks like on the ground. So we're 
disturbed very little soil with the drill. And, and we found this in a lot of places where we disturb that small amount of soil, we only really see weeds come up in that tiny band. So in some ways it's, it's bad because that's the only place we want the crop, but it's good because it does really show that uh, soil movement is, is, is a bit of an issue. So if we move on to, to companion crops, um, this is uh, oil seed rape this year. Um, it's not been quite such a difficult year to establish oil seed rape. Um, so this was drilled on the 7th of August, direct drilled. Um, and that's oil seed rape with a companion crop of vetch, bursleam and crimson clover, and also buckwheat. So here we're, we're aiming for competition. So we, we've selected the weeds we want to drill, and we want them to compete and stop other weeds from uh, from being able to germinate. Um, just to show you, this is uh, this picture was taken a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're hoping that we're going to be able to get some frosts in there to start thinning that out a little bit. Um, the buckwheat has done its business and, and is dying back in there already. Um, but for an oil seed rape crop, this was um, farm safe seed. We checked it for uricic acid. Um, we had no seed dressing, no starter fertilizer, no pre-em, no insecticides, no fungicides at this stage. Um, as time goes by, we will astro curve that to take away the, the companion crop. Um, but it's having a massive effect on, on the amount of biodiversity that we're seeing within that crop uh, in the way of bugs and beasties, invertebrates. Um, which is just absolutely fascinating to see. And when we start to dig up some of these plants, the amount of root that is, a, that is down there doing a lot of good, putting organic matter back into the soil, um, yeah, it, it's really, really nice to see. And just to give you an idea, that field up until now has cost us about £43 a hectare. Um, 28 of that have been on uh, putting a cost on the farm safe seed plus a companion seed and the royalty that we've um, paid for the seed as well. So all us had really a seed, a few slug pellets, um, a pre-drilled glyphosate and one graminicide and that will have a, an astro curb at some point. So moving on to the to the cover crop side of things, uh, we've been growing cover crops for 10 years um, and now all of our spring crop land will have a cover crop on it. Um, the mixture has evolved over time um, we have no brassicas in these mixes. We've, we've found problems with slugs, historical problems with slugs, which we're hoping we've got through now. Um, so in, in this mix, we've got sunflowers, vetch lupins, camelina, bursleam and crimson clover, buckwheat. Um, so again, this picture was taken probably two, three weeks ago. Uh, we, we've had a couple of fairly light frosts down here, so we're starting to see things start to um, go back a little bit. Um, cost of that lot was about £30, um, but that's all under a stewardship scheme, so we do get a slug of money for that. Um, but what we're looking for cover crops is we're not looking so much for um, a great deal of biomass on top. We're looking more for what the roots are doing underneath. Um, but obviously there's massive benefits from again to, for biodiversity um, so what we try and do to ease the burden on uh, taking up all the nutrients in the cover crop and, and waiting for those nutrients to become available again we have what we've called sequential senescence so we're trying to get things within these crops that actually start to die off as we go through and, and as you can see now the buckwheat is already gone um, and with a few frosts and cold nights that we're supposed to be having this week, we'll see the facility go back, the sunflowers will start to start to decline. So, um, yeah, we like to see things starting to go backwards. So what we've tried as a, as a, a non-chemical weed control on these is a bit of rolling. Um, no crimper roller, just a straightforward Cambridge roller. Um, this picture was taken in January 20. Um, and, and it, frost is a natural killer. It will start to take things out while they're growing, but actually if you can bruise them and roll them, they will go a lot quicker. Problem is we don't get enough frosts in this country to actually make this a, a, a planned approach. So it's really an, an opportunist thing 
um, on those one or two cold mornings that we get to have an effect on it. Um, so this, this crop has already thinned out. Some of the earlier cover crop species in there have already started to die back. Um, so the rolling is uh, making a big difference on a, on a very cold, frosty morning. Um, but a word of warning, this slide is showing that uh, on the left, this was a 60 acre field that we were doing. Um, so on the left was where I started. Uh, sorry, on the right is where I started and worked off that way. Uh, and then so probably an hour later, came back and carried on and worked across to the left. So a massive difference in the amount of kill that we've got on a really hard frost compared to a frost that's going out. Um, whether a crimper roller would have done it better or not, I, I don't know. So this is really where um, I can see we've got you know, uh, gone from Steve and Chloe's presentation, we, we've got a lot of contributors to these weed problems. And, and one of the key ones for me is really high nitrogen rates. We're throwing more and more nitrogen on these crops um, to get the, the yields that we're hoping for. Um, but as we found through some trials we've done on the farm, you know, we can be throwing anything up to 100 kilos of nitrogen just to get the last ton of yield out of a crop. Um, which uh, in financial terms pays for itself, but actually if you look at the negative side of what it's doing to the soil, and, and as we've heard, the negative side of what that's doing to our weed control in future years, um, it's something that we've got to start to question with the amount of nitrogen that's left in the soil. Um, the excessive soil movement, yes, the no-till is a massive improvement for us um, with uh, not bringing all these weeds back up again. Tight rotation, limited opportunities, that comes back to letting some weeds dominate because you're having that same set of circumstances each time. <clears throat> Poor soil structure, bad drainage, <clears throat> excuse me, this sort of thing is, yeah, another contributor. And the challenge and weather conditions, we know we've had two very wet autumns over the last two years, um, but we've also had dry harvests to a degree which then affects the amount of germination we get for, for the weed seeds that are on top. So putting the crop in um, and then having all these weed seeds that do actually germinate after that. I think um, that's probably nearly my lot. The only thing that I would want to say is that, uh, you know, the innovation that we're trying to achieve on farm um, chemically is being a barrier to that as a regulation that we have on chemicals that we'd like to be able to use in slightly oddball circumstances within the cover crops, etc., which uh, are not legal to do at the moment. So I think I'll uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you also, Steve. I think rather than uh, and launch into individual questions i think we'll we'll open up for the panel and um possibly invite questions for everybody but i will start w with you david we had um right first one how long did it take you to notice a difference in the amounts of weed in the system and were the first few years particularly difficult with yield loss with an increase in weeds before showing an improvement? Um, I, I think it's, it's probably taken two or three years to see a real difference in the amount of weeds, but uh, it hadn't caused a yield loss because we were still in the old system of uh, conventional agronomy and preems and stuff like that. So it's only now that we're sort of six, seven years in that we're looking at um, using uh, non-conventional agronomy i don't know if that's the right term um but just looking to wait and see what we've got rather than just doing what we've done every year of having a pre-em to to take all the weeds out am i unmuted now um another question for david i think at this point did you drill the companion crop and the oilseed rape at the same time or was there a gap between drilling uh, we drilled them all at the same time as a mix. We 
it in the grow. We have tried it in the past of putting a companion crop in before, um, really with a view to uh, having an effect on cabbage and blue beetle. Um, but we didn't find there's a lot of difference in it. Thanks. Um, Steve, uh, we'll move over to you for, for, for some now. Okay. Some of your non-competitive weeds are extremely difficult in, in veg crops. Is anything here really integrated or just looking at the crop in the ground? Well, the competitive tables did come from wheat, so it's competing with wheat. And yeah, there will be different weeds, will be different problems in different crops. So I expect there to be there should be some different tables for different um, crops and some will give different um, harvesting difficulties too depending on the methods employed so um, there will be a variation from crop to crop as to what could be left and what can't be left um, and yeah I am really looking at what's in the ground um, but it is an integrated system we are thinking about what we need to do um, all along you know, everything is looking at um, thresholds when we're looking at crops it's not a case of trying to kill everything all the time for agronomists. Okay. And Steve, again, can we have, this is a question, can we have more information on which herbicides leave which weeds and have it presented all together rather than look at herbicide labels ourselves? Yeah, unfortunately, the, the labels only provide information to what is actually controlled by weeds and uh, by the products, but not what is not necessarily controlled because everything on a product label has to be agreed by CRD so it's everything that's back up can be backed up and supported by the manufacturer I think if you go onto the manufacturer's websites you'll get a lot more information about um, which weeds are controlled at what size and even what are not controlled which is far more useful and perhaps just to throw back to AHDB it's some, perhaps something that AHDB could put together to help farmers and Agronomists maybe as well would be used would find it useful to have somewhere where there is, you know, a table that has the products and what they control and what they don't control. Indeed. And and uh, and, and with you it's sort of a similar sort of thing. Would it be possible to change the timings of herbicide applications for more weed tolerance? For example, forego pre M herbicide and do an early post M. I think certainly for for most weeds it probably would be. I think the problem with the pro um, the preem is a very much a prophylactic treatment that's based on history, and it's really targeting black grass. If there's no black grass in the system, where preem obviously does a much much better job than going post em, then actually in most cases you could go post em and wait to see what you've got, monitor it, and then take an action that you need to take rather than this big sledgehammer that we have to do for black grass. And it may be that just changing the crop rotation will get rid of a lot of the black grass anyway, which is what we've had to do on some farms. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's, let's move to, uh, to Chloe for, uh, for the next two. Chloe, could the weeds with potential benefits be thought of as a, um, a form of companion crop? Um, as a renaming to remove the stigma behind the term weeds? Yeah, um, I think so. I think it's, I mean, you, you sort of want to come into these things gently, right? So we don't want to be saying to farmers straight away, like, oh, look at all this horrible black grass you've got. What a great companion crop. Well, I think that what we need to be thinking about is shifting slowly out of the intensive control that we have at the moment so that the weeds, as we learn more about weeds, they become easier to manage. And then we can really consider them a companion crop when there's something that we we better understand how to cooperate with. Um, but yes, I, as you might have noticed in my talk, I sometimes use the phrase wild arable plants or arable plant diversity. And that is, yeah, in an attempt to move in that direction that we need to recognise the positive functions that weeds have in our farming systems. Yeah, thanks. And I think Steve used the term non-arable crops um and, and, and again plants. was it sorry yeah um chloe another one for you should an ipm plan integrated pest management plan uh include a measure of how many weeds we're keeping in the field 
I think it could certainly be a goal. Um, yes. Yeah, so we did some research in um, South Africa looking at long-term cropping systems and the weeds that resulted. And what we found was that generally as your weed diversity goes up, the number of weeds that you have goes down. And both of these things occur in more diverse systems. So the number of weed species you have is both a good thing in itself and that it, it probably means less competition, but it's also a sign that your management of your system is becoming more sustainable um, because the weed, that's, the weed diversity is a sign that that intensive pressure every year has been reduced so that more life can thrive in and around your crops um, without causing so many problems. So yes, I would say make, make that a goal of IPM. Okay, thank you. This one, I think, um, we'll start with Steve. I think you can pr perhaps all comment on it. Uh, Steve, first, please. Does basis training for new agronomists need to become more holistic and include novel thinking like that of Chloe? The simple answer is yes. Of course it does. I think we've all got to be thinking in a more IPM um, way anyway. And if we can think about leaving something behind or think about how we can do that, then yes, I actually train basis or part of the course in Hampshire and my role is in training the IPM section. So I do try to include that sort of thing in the training in that course. Yes. Thanks. And, and David, would you like to comment on that as well? Uh, yeah, uh, that's easy. The simple answer, yes. Um, I think our um, uh, move away from conventional agronomy over the last year has um, really opened our eyes as to what the, the potential could be for other forms of weed control, pest control, um, and looking at nutrition as the as the cornerstone of, of everything from pests to disease um, and also to weeds. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, I don't think we know enough about it but I think that's got to be the start of the journey. Absolutely. Can I, can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I completely agree with what both um, Steve and David said. And I think it would be, be really great if the conversation around weeds in general, so not just in terms of training agronomists, but becomes broader. Because at the moment, sort of industry and research thinks that farmers want tools to control weeds. But if the conversation shifts to, no, we want tools that allow us to keep some weeds but not use, le not lose yield, then uh, hopefully there would be more of a response from science and industry to provide tools that help people to do that. So yes, definitely, but let's shift the whole conversation, not just what we're teaching young agronomists. Okay, thanks. And there's, a, there's a, um, another one I want to put to all of you as well. Um, how do we support farmers and agronomists to try and push them outside their comfort zone. Um, well, should we start with that one again? Should we, should we go to Steve first, please? Okay. Um, I think it comes back to that those crop competition tables that I had to dig fairly deep to try and find. But I remember back when I started, there were people talking about crop equivalents. So, you know, how many weeds would be equivalent to one crop of wheat, to one plant of wheat, and that sort of thing. And perhaps we've got to revisit those tables and look at um, where those figures are again and just remind people because a lot of what we do is just quickly pushed into weed control but perhaps we need to be have the, that information that a few pansies for example are going to give you a zero percent yield reduction and it's just having that information more readily available Thanks. David, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's really, um, I think it's, it's got to be farmer to farmer and farmers doing things and seeing what works and then that going back to agronomists. I, I think that's, um, it probably seems an odd way an odd knowledge trail, but I think that's the way we've got to go. And I think um, AHDB are in a, in a classic place with strategic and monitor farms to be able to have farmers look at other farmers that are doing things which are actually working within their area. 
which gives them confidence, you know, just to see something on a slide or whatever saying this works um, is not going to be enough. Farms are a funny bunch. A comment from Chloe on that one? Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, David's spot on there. Um, I mean, not only the, yeah, but also the, we, there's so many farmers out there, right? The more of them that are trying to find out what works and what doesn't work, the better chance we have of finding out what does work. Um, and then when they figure out if it works, we, we really have a good idea that it, not just that it's sort of, you know, we can do a nice experiment as scientists and see something that works, but often we have no idea how practical that is within a given farming system. Like, does it fit in with your combines and your drying equipment and all that sort of thing? Um, and I guess maybe something that's relevant here is that perhaps there's a lot we could learn from organic farmers. There's a few came across a couple of studies showing that when you went out and surveyed farmers about how worried they were about weeds, actually organic farmers are not nearly as stressed as conventional farmers. So I guess that shows that when you, you know, you switch to something like organic or perhaps as David has done, in the first couple of years you might think, oh, this is unknown, I don't know what's going to happen, you're quite worried, but after a few years you you know, you get into a pattern that works for you, the weeds aren't a problem, or they're not, they're not a problem that you can't manage, therefore they cause less stress and less worry. And that, and when farmers can start to share with each other what's working for them and that it's not, it's not a problem, then that's, that'd be a great way forwards. Great, thank you. And, and we're going to have to make this the last question, I think. Um, David, what area of Hampshire are you in? And how would you say your soil land type compares to a poorer area and do you think this has contributed to the success of the no-till system you employ um yeah we're we're just south of basingstoke um either side of the m3 um, um i'm not sure i mean I've, i'm in contact with a lot of no-till farmers across the country um i don't think that poorer area is probably a, a good description i think we're in a fairly poor area for um, having a soil type that will retain nutrients. Um, I think possibly people in heavier land areas, wetter conditions will probably be more difficult to um, have the success that we've had. But there are people that are doing it as successfully as we are. Very good, thank you. I um, th th there are other questions, I think, but we'll we'll have to call it a day for now. But that doesn't mean we can't answer them because there is that platform afterwards. So there are other means. But for now, I think I um, I wish to thank all of our speakers very much, um, Emily, Chloe, Steve, and David, for providing us with um, plenty of food for thought, um, for sharing your insights with us. Um, for your willingness to do that. Um, just a closing thought, the times are changing um, ever more quickly, it seems. And uh, just to quote something Steve said the other day, uh, we're looking at a different future for agriculture, which involves a bit of thought and, a, and, and work. Um, comments taken on board, thanks. Yes, so some work for AHDB on the um, your, your recommendations, Steve, a few minutes ago. Thanks for that. Um, I, I wish to thank our um, support team for, for this evening. We've got, um, we had Ben and, 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 and Johnny in the digital team, Aaron, the events team, um, Natalie sending the questions across, um, colleague in the knowledge exchange managers. Um, many thanks for all that. To all of you uh, attending this evening, thank you for joining us. Thanks for your questions and your comments. Um, could I remind you, please, just this is just this last bit, a few reminders for you not to forget things. Um, can you please complete the feedback session? Um, you'll find it if you scroll down, there's all sorts of information further down your screen. Do remember, if you haven't done, to apply for your basis and Naroso points. Um, complete the form in the left-hand menu. You'll need to enter the unique code shown on the screen now. Um, we hope you'll enjoy some more of Agronomy Week. Um, there's some more uh, starting again tomorrow, uh, including the Agronomy induction at nine o'clock. Um, there's also recommended list session tomorrow, tomorrow uh, later tomorrow morning. Uh, in the afternoon, there's fungicide performance. And um, the last one of the day tomorrow 
is cover crops, rotations and niche cropping. And if you have any questions or you wish to contact me, I'm available on the Agronomy Week platform using the chat function, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. <laughs>